Oh, our scripture this morning is another long one because you just got to hear the whole thing. <clears throat> it's a story you know about. <clears throat> it reminds me of a song we used to sing in choir, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. <laughs> Joshua chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 1 through 20. Joshua 6. 1 through 20. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. I want you to think about that for a second. They were afraid of the Israelites so much they wouldn't leave their town. <laughs> they wouldn't go through the gates. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. Oh, I should have brought my shofar this morning. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. And when you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse, and the people can charge straight into the town. So Joshua called together the priests and said, Take up the ark of the Lord's covenant and assign seven priests to walk in front of us, each carrying a ram's horn. Then he gave orders to the people. March around the town, and the armed men will lead the way in front of the ark of the Lord. And after Joshua spoke to the pe people, the seven priests with the ram's horns started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched. And the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Some of the armed men marched in front of the priests with the horns, and some behind the ark with the priests continually blowing the horns. Do not shout! Do not even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout, then shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day, and then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horns marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priest with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. And all this time, the priests were blowing their horns. And on the second day, they again marched around the town once and returned to the camp. And they followed this pattern for six days. And on the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times, and the seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected our spies. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction, or you yourselves will be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. And when the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could, and suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed. And the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. The word of God for the people of God. I love that story. The last time I preached this was a few years ago. And uh, we were going through a lot of warfare in that church. <laughs> a lot of it was because they didn't like their pastor. But <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> Imagine that. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. <laughs> but
But um, at the end of the sermon, uh, sermon uh, I brought, I did bring my shofar. I'm so upset I didn't bring my shofar this morning. I'll try to remember to bring it next time because I do want you to see it here. But um, a shofar is a ram's horn that they used, and and they used it to uh, before uh, battle. It was a victory sound. It, it was like an alarm. Uh, telling them we're coming to get you. <laughs> and it was also used afterwards as a victory, but it's still used. Uh, um, people use it, you know, even in ministry because it's, uh, it, there's a lot of spiritual meaning to blowing a shofar and, and, and what it does to um, dark things and that sort of thing. That's a whole different topic, but um and I also want to say that, but anyway, after I finished this sermon uh, a few years ago, I had those that were willing to walk around the uh, church building with me six times. And on the seventh time, I, I blew my shofar. And we started just declaring that, you know, Jesus is Lord and Jesus has won this battle. Because there, there was just a real divisive spirit in the church. And we were just trying to break that, those that who were willing. But um, it's it, it's a powerful, it's a powerful ministry tool. Uh, and I also want to highlight before I get to talking about this, I've got several scriptures uh, that I'm going to share this morning. But um, I also want to, when whenever we start and, and we're talking about it, uh, having. Sunday school, our Bible studies on, on Sunday mornings, which we will hopefully be starting soon. We will start unpacking a lot of these things that I allude to, that there is so much going on. And I think one of the first things I want to approach is the times of Noah and what was really going on in the earth uh, and why the flood was necessary. Uh, because it was not because people were just being bad. There was so much more going on spiritually. There was, um, uh, it, it's just fascinating. And it's all right there in scripture, but it's not taught on in depth very much. So that's one of the first things. But a lot of the time when the Lord is telling people, and there's, there's this conflict of a lot of people who are um, antagonistic to scripture, to the Bible, they're atheists or Satanist or just agnostic or whatever the case is, they're not believers. <laughs> and a lot of their heartburn, if you will, with scripture is, my gosh, what an angry, wrathful God. You know, he told them to go in and, and kill everybody and, you know, all the livestock, the, the men and the women and the children and the slaves and the livestock, that there would be no living thing left. And they're like, what God would do that? Well, if we go back, and I hope I'm piquing your curiosity, but if you go back to the days of Noah and what the enemy had accomplished with compromising the human race, of, of, of making things that were unholy, unholy beings, when that was happening, there was no salvation for those people. They were already corrupt spiritually because of all those things. And I know I'm kind of speaking in crypto now, but but I'll explain it all. But it was it was necessary. And if you come to understand that, it makes you understand that that is not a mean, wrathful God against his own people. And uh, it, it just helps you align everything in scripture, regardless of those events happening, that God is still so good and so pure, and that's why it had to happen. So anyway, I, I just really, really rabbit trail there. I didn't mean to bring all that up, but it just reminded me of it when he said uh, uh, in this scripture um, that, you know, the only ones that would survive would be Rahab, you know, the prostitute, because she, you know, was when the spies went in to check out Jericho and she hit him and then, 
You know, they said she'd be spared if she uh, put the little red rope down. She actually lived in the wall of Jericho. There were little dwellings in the wall because the wall was uh, huge. It was tall, but it was really, really thick as well. And it was so wide and thick that they had little dwellings in it. And so she was in one of those dwellings, and that's how she put her little um, red rope or scarf or whatever scripture said that it was, and they knew that's where she was, and they spared her and, and took her with them. But that, going all the way back to Genesis and the flood, this will make more sense of why God would not let one person live. So, anyway, um, continuing our sermon series on ordinary people who have extraordinary faith. Um, I want to kind of back up to some of the things that happened. Lydia, did I just totally lose everybody when I said all that? Was I just like rambling? Are you? <laughs> I feel like I was just rambling. You guys were like, okay. <laughs> You're like, we can't imagine why that other church wouldn't. <laughs> you'll be fascinated. You'll be fascinated. And you'll be so uh so delighted to have that deeper perspective on everything. It just, it changed me. Um, so anyway, I want to uh, back up to right before this happened, this battle of Jericho. Um, in Joshua chapter 1, verses 3 and 5, uh, God is speaking to Joshua and he says, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. Isn't that amazing? From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. And that's a word for us today. That is something we need to remember. So shortly after this word from the Lord, Joshua sent a couple of spies, as we know, to scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River to see what they were going to be up against when they stepped into this God-given land. They just they, they trusted the Lord, hopefully, but they still wanted to get some eyes on, right? Before, just so they could uh, be better prepared. And uh, scripture tells us that the king of Jericho found out about the spies in the city and swept the town to find them. But the prostitute by the name of Rahab did uh, hit them and help them escape, which we uh, talked about that, and we probably all heard that story and read the story. And it's very telling to hear her reaction to them. It was the common mindset of everyone else in Jericho, including the king. So I told you I'm going to be throwing a lot of scriptures at you. So here we have in Joshua 1 this promise that the Lord gave to Joshua. He said, everything I promised Moses is your promise too. Everywhere you set your foot, it's yours. It's yours. I give it to you. Wherever you walk, that's your land. And so we hear after um, they, he gets this promise and he sends the spies out. Joshua 2 verses 8 through 11 tells us, Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. And I want you to hear her mindset. Because this was the whole city of Jericho, including the king. This is how they thought. She said, I know the Lord has given you this land. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sion and Gog, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God 
is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Now why were they so terrified of the Israelites? Well, it wasn't the people they were afraid of. It was their God, our God. They didn't want any part of coming against God's people because they knew that God fought for his people and he was and is undefeatable <laughs> when God is for you. Who can be against you? God showed his power in such mighty and unimaginable ways that left people trembling just hearing the stories in distant lands. If they heard the Israelites were coming, and this is quite a shift, right? Because we've also heard um, other stories of where they were going to snuff out the Israelites, right? In the story of Esther and, and you know, how the, the king, they were going to totally wipe them out, right? But in this particular time and age, just the mention of the name of the Israelites, and everyone was like, <gasps> keep them away from us, you know? So... Joshua, uh, so after the spies returned to camp, in Joshua 3, verses 9 through 16, another scripture, Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites ahead of you. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priests will carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. And as soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream, and the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant ahead of them. And it was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests were carrying the Ark, who were carrying the Ark, touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarephath. And the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. And then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Now scripture also tells us that they made an altar of 12 stones gathered from the riverbed to honor God's miraculous parting of the Jordan River. He had already parted the Red Sea, but here he parts the Jordan River. Now all this time, before crossing the Jordan River, the people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, had been eating the manna from heaven that God had been raining upon them. That was how they were sustaining themselves, because they were in the wilderness. There were no crops. There, were no, uh, there was no propagation anywhere. And in the wilderness, uh, you know, apparently there, it was scarce of living creatures that they could, that were edible anyway. <clears throat> All this time, the Lord was still raining manna from heaven to sustain them. But then after they crossed the Jordan River, which was during harvest time, Scripture tells us, they were able to start gathering wheat and livestock to feed themselves, and the provision of manna stopped. Now all this leads up to the famous Battle of Jericho. The Lord had shown the Israelites on many occasions that he would provide for them. He would make a way for them. <clears throat> Even if it meant parting the waters of the seas or the rivers. If it meant uh, raining down manna or quail. If it meant striking a rock for water to gush forward. If it meant in the middle of the night for there to be a calm of a fire to guide them through the wilderness or during the day a, a pillar of a cloud to lead them by day. All this time he was leading them by these miraculous signs and wonders. They were completely helpless. Completely helpless and helpless and unable to feed 
themselves or protect themselves or, or to even guide themselves. He did everything to provide for them. And now he had promised to give them every parcel of land they stepped foot on. But none were as fortified as the city of Jericho. How on earth, they must have thought, would they take this city with a towering, well-guarded wall in the way? Now Joshua 5, verses 13 through 15, gives us some insight. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you a friend or a foe? Neither one, he replied, I am the commander of the Lord's army. <laughs> at this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. You see, this was like the moment recorded in 2 Kings chapter 6, when the enemy had surrounded the city that Elisha was staying in and his servant was paralyzed with fear. He woke up in the morning and he saw the mountains just speckled with all of the enemy's uh, forces coming into him and he was trembling with fear and he was just like, Elisha, oh my gosh, they've surrounded us, they're surely going to kill us. And he was just like, Psh. And he just said, Lord, Actually, the scripture is in 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes. Let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. It was the Lord's army, an army of warrior angels. And there were more there for them than there were against them. So, much in that way, the Lord, even though this battle of Jericho seemed impossible by human standards, I mean, the Israelites at this point were kind of in bad shape. <laughs> They've been wandering around, wandering around in the wilderness all the time. They haven't had time to, to build up their armed forces and make weapons and all this other stuff. They were just trying to survive. And so they really weren't you know, completely prepared for this, you know, intense battle when there was such a fortress in front of them that seemed impenetrable. Did I say that right? Impenetrable? <laughs> That's what I would say. Um, but the Lord gave Joshua this glimpse. And he didn't just send an angel because there are multitudes, legions of angels. He sent the one who was the commander of the entire Lord's angelic army. I mean, he sent the top guy on the angelic armed forces. <laughs> and he sent him to say, we got this. You just do as you're told. Because the battle had already been won, right? So that's how he had this, this confidence when everyone else thought surely he lost his mind. And this is, this is what was going on with Joshua and the Israelites. And the battle had already begun in the spiritual realm. I want you to think about that. They were looking at all this ominous stuff that just seemed impossible, this huge mountain they couldn't bring down and they couldn't cross or go around. But the battle had already begun in the spiritual realm. That wall literally was already coming down. They just couldn't see it yet. The scales had already been tipped in their divine favor. The commander of the Lord's army presented himself to Joshua to let him know that the angel armies were already on the scene. And God was about to fight for them again. Now what happened next was surely a head scratcher for the Israelite army. They were supposed to do what? <laughs> They're supposed to march around the city of Jericho making no war cry, keeping their swords 
in their sheaves, one time around, without one tiny little peep of the word. <laughs> Only the priests were allowed to blow their shofars. And they were supposed to do this six days in a row. And then on the seventh day, they were just supposed to shout. <laughs> I mean, come on. They had to, you know, even if you've seen a lot of things that God's done, you must have thought, Joshua, did you sleep well last night? Because <laughs> are you sure you got that right? But when you see the Lord part the Red Sea, <laughs> when you see them part the, the River Jordan, when you see him rain quail and manna from the sky, when you see him spring forth water from a boulder in the middle of a dry desert, when you've seen what our Almighty God can do, you don't question it. It's like I have said at the closing of each one of these sermons, you don't know how he's going to do it, but you know he will. And you do what he says. You stand in faith with high expectation of how he is going to show up. You may not know how he is going to deliver you, you just know that he will. Now I want to turn our focus because I find it uh, a little bit funny and I'm not, uh, there's loss of life involved with that and I'm not trying to minimize that and we'll address that at a future date but um, I just, I think it's a, a little bit comical if you have to think of those people inside the walls of Jericho and what must have been going through their minds. So they were already afraid of the Israelites. And I tried to think of what this would be like in contemporary times. You know, if, let's just say, um, you know, we were all under attack and, and we all had to bunker down in our church and fortify it or something like that. And, you know, we had heard of this, you know, terrible, ruthless army that has all this technology and they could just obliterate us or whatever and they, we've already heard you know, how powerful they are and how they're overtaking, you know, everybody else and then they show up and we're already afraid, right? And they just start walking around. <laughs> just one time and then they leave. And the next day they do the same thing. Can you imagine after six days how unnerving that would be? I mean, you would just, it'd be like waiting for it to happen any moment, and it's not, and then they leave. I mean, it, that's crazy mental warfare, isn't it? I mean, that's just crazy mental warfare. And that's what these people inside the walls of Jericho must have been thinking. It's like peeking, trying to peek through, you know, not get their uh, attention on them, and See, they don't even have their swords drawn, and they're like, they're just walking. <laughs> just walking around. And they're just like, Psh, not a word. And they had to be thinking, what is going on? Crazy. Yes, it would be crazy, and it would be very unnerving. But then on that seventh day, they all just let out that fierce battle cry. And are just going around, you know, I don't know, maybe they were still marching. I think they'd be running. That'd be me, you know. It just seems like it would fit. But that's not scriptural. It doesn't say that he did that. But they just let out that battle cry and they blow their shofars and those walls came tumbling down. I mean, that's crazy. And our God's not crazy, but he does some crazy good things. I mean, he does some things that are just like, <laughs> they're mind-blowing. Now, this is how things work in the spiritual realm. Even today, the enemy knows when there are believers who know the power of God inside them. He knows who he's up against. How does he know? because of how we live, because of how we talk, because of how we pray, because of how we speak to others. He knows people who are not sure about the power of God, you know, or the people that are like, my God, and you know, <laughs> you know, that he knows. He knows, he can't read our minds like the Lord can, 
that he certainly can read our behaviors and our words. And he knows when there are believers who know the power of God within them, that know God still deploys his angel armies to fight for them, and that know that there is no enemy, not physical or spiritual, that is any match for our God. Now see, these people in Jericho, they knew that. They already knew it. That's why they were so scared. They are like, oh my gosh, they're going to bring their God with them. <laughs> we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. We've heard stories about the God of Israel. Well, that's who's fighting for us. The enemy's worst fear, his worst fear is that you're going to believe it. <laughs> his worst fear is that you're truly going to believe in the amazing power of God and what he will do to fight for you and that that power of God is within you, that you will actually be bold enough to have the faith that would proclaim that kind of power of God. That's his worst fear. Because if he can just keep us kind of, you know, in our space, <laughs> if he can keep us kind of where we just like, oh, you know, that's, that's too big of a thing. I'll just step back and let other people contend for that. If he can keep us in a, a, a more non confirmed place, if he can keep us just those people that are, you know, reactive instead of proactive, that, that will pray but not really believe that God really will show up. If he can keep us there, he's won a lot more territory than we should be given him. His worst fear, I would say his nightmare, would be that every one of us would actually have that kind of faith have the kind of faith that we would walk around the city of Jericho six times without uttering a word. And on the seventh time, yelling when it made no sense to anybody else, but we would do it because God said to, and <laughs> Joshua 23.10 tells us, one man, one man can put to flight a thousand. For the Lord your God is who is fighting for you, just as he promised. One man, one woman can put to flight a thousand because of who God is. And then he fights for us. So for this reason, we must never quit when things get challenging. Instead, we just have to keep believing God's promises. Our Father God expects us to have unshakable faith in Him, no matter how bleak things might seem in the natural realm. And you know, I love Romans 8.37, because it says, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. We're not just conquerors. We're not sometimes conquerors. We are more than conquerors. More than conquerors through Jesus Christ, who is the one who deploys the angel armies to fight for us. I hope you're convinced that angel armies do fight for you. Oh my gosh, there are so many amazing testimonies on people who have literally seen them show up on the scene. So we gotta keep our faith in God what God can and will do on our behalf and be strong and courageous in all situations because we know that with God, all things are possible. When we have unshakable faith in our God, we'll see mountains move. We will never be defeated by the powers of darkness. And there's so much in this world. When we have unshakable faith in our God, no matter how impossible the path before us may seem to travel, be to travel, the day will come 
when we will step one foot in that river and the waters will be pushed back. The day will come when those ominous, towering walls that seem like undefeatable obstacles will come tumbling down. So don't be discouraged whenever things seem impossible. When it seems like there's this foreboding mountain in front of you that is just going to stay there. Don't be discouraged. Keep your faith because there's no victory without a battle. There's no testimony without a test. There's no miracle without an impossible circumstance. Whatever it is in your life that feels like an obstacle keeping you or your loved ones from God's promises, remember these testimonies of extraordinary faith. These were ordinary people. And the only thing different from the time that they lived in is the date on the calendar. <laughs> that's the only thing that's different. The culture might have been different. The year might have been different. Technology was definitely different. But nothing else has changed. Our God is still doing extraordinary things for his people. And he is for us. And he will, he will deploy every angel he has to fight for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for these testimonies of faith that you have given us in your holy word that remind us of how powerful you are and, and how just awesome you, the stories are of how you moved in these miraculous, just hard to believe ways. But we know it's true. Help us to, to be the people that, that never shrink away from, from believing that you will do it again right now in our midst. Help us to stay encouraged of that truth. Embolden us. Give us courage. And we thank you. We thank you that you are the God of the angel armies, that you are the God of one and only true holy God who is always for us and never against us. In the name of your son Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat>